all with them. There's, I end up taking pages upon pages of notes, um, just brilliant insights, very passionate about simulation, uh, a lot of experience in simulation and bringing that experience into this new virtual frontier. Um, that's one of the most exciting things that I'm looking for is that uh, what I fell in love with in simulation is how innovative this community is and really kind of testing new ideas. And then, you know, now hopefully we're building a platform that's not about us, but it's about you and allowing you to continue being innovators and bring that into the uh, into the virtual world, extending a virtual dimension to uh, simulation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mitch. Um, really excited to have them here today. Thanks, Mitch. And Mitch, if I can interrupt one more time, as Mitch is talking, if you have questions that you think of that you want uh, to, to share with Mitch, type them in uh, in the chat, please. And I'll be keeping track of that to make sure we don't lose those thoughts and we can get back to it at the end. Thank you. Sorry, I'll, Mitch, I'll also add. I'll also add and introduce before Mitch even gets a chance to speak twice now. But um, I would recommend because if you look at Mitch's background, they are in the new VR center that they built. And they're going to be talking about that. So I would recommend in your upper right corner, if you haven't already, go to your view and have go to speaker view rather than gallery if you haven't already. So you can see uh, when they're talking, all the stuff that's in the background there up close. So, all right. Now, really, go ahead. <laughs> did I unmute? Okay, I did. Okay. I'm always worried about doing that. So um, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to have everyone here. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. Just making sure that sound is doing what it's supposed to be doing right now. Um, I didn't really prepare anything formal. I'm more going to just kind of share with you what we're doing and how we kind of got here. Um, and then hopefully you guys will have questions and you will feel free to ask and we'll share as much as we can. And if I don't know, then I will make sure that Rick or John get answers out to you guys after I figure out the answer. So. Um, this is our new XR lab. We opened it in August of this year, and uh, I'll just kind of step out of the way here so you can see. Um, we have a total of nine stations, one of those being the instructor station. So that is our big instructor station there, so I can demo things for students along with our clean boxes for cleaning headsets. And in the approach that we took in designing the lab, um, we had to consider a lot of factors, um, thinking about things like um, American with Disabilities Act compliance, and also how we were planning on using a catechist. Um, and our big thing was we wanted to expand the number of nursing students that we can admit into our program, because one of the biggest obstacles we have is clinical placements, which that's what the vast majority of people that we hear from say that clinical placements is a huge challenge. So um, I was tasked with, okay, let's figure out how we can do that with simulation. And in our regular sim lab, I realized that we were maxed out. And I think it was John that was telling me yesterday, or maybe it was Rick, that um, there was a new simulation center that was built and within the first few months they were booked out for three years and you know that was millions and millions of dollars and years of work to get it open and then it was maxed out can't really be used and can't meet their needs and so when we started looking at virtual reality as a way to do that more affordably um, we spent some time just playing around with different ways of doing things. We first started off with having a laptop thinking, you know, we'll take it in the classroom. Oh, I am sorry, uh, Jeffrey, yes. I am in Green Bay, Wisconsin at Northeast Wisconsin Technical College. So thank you for that. Um, so when we were looking at things, we thought laptops would be a great solution. We realized quickly that is not a good solution for us and our needs because it required a lot of labor to do. And I knew that my faculty would never ever do that um, because they're busy on their own without having to worry about going and getting laptops and then moving things around in the room to make it big enough and safe enough for students to do virtual reality. So um, we then started 
toying around with different uh, lab concepts. And actually in our trades area, we opened up a, a smaller VR lab for use with our architecture program. And so I started working in that lab to figure out what worked, what didn't work, and uh, what our needs were. And what we really came down to was that um, we needed to be able to have room to move, we needed to be able to meet our um, ADA regulations, and we needed to have um, a safe space for our students. Um, we found during our time of working with students in the smaller lab that um, like doing a sitting down moment for their virtual reality was not a great choice for nursing. It worked well for architecture, but not for the nursing program. So when we started designing, and I'll kind of step out of the way and kind of show you a few of our stations here, um, we chose to go with these small movable uh, tables here and chairs, and I hopefully you can still hear me. Um, everything here is movable, so that way then if we were having to do a screen-based version, a student can scoot back and be able to see their screen easily and work here and do a screen-based version of a catechus for those who have motion sickness, seizures, migraines, or if they're just nervous to do something like that because they're uh, not very familiar with technology. And we decided to mount everything onto the wall. Um, so as you can see next to the screen, there is the computer and the headset. And we did that because we were trying to make sure again that the desk was movable for students so that they wouldn't have to worry about cords and things like that. And then we set up the Quest 2 headsets and we actually set them up as wireless uh, to give us that more freedom of movement because in nursing there's times when you do get down on the ground. Um, in the dynamic cardiology uh, scenario that Bill Ballow has set up and so wonderfully put in a lot of work to, um, you kind of have to get down on the ground to do things with the patient. And so we wanted to have that ability to not be stuck with um, sitting all the time. But if we had people who needed to sit, we decided to go with the taller chairs and all of the desks are adjustable on height. And we did that because in a catechus, height matters. Um, if you were sitting in a lower chair, then your height's gonna be at belly button level of kind of normal people. And so we got the taller pub chairs uh, or countertop height chairs to make sure that people could mimic their actual height in a catechist if they needed to sit down. The latest addition we have, and I, I'm gonna try to tilt this down far enough, is we added in mats and they kind of got moved around from our cleaning crew. But in these mats, they actually have a wonderful little texture on them so that when students are working in a catechus, they can feel the difference and they know that they're going out of their safety boundaries. So before I run a virtual reality day with our students, um, I come in and I make sure all my safety boundaries are reset up and that they're on where the maps need to be. Because like I said, the cleaning people, when they vacuum, things get moved around. Um, and that's the setup of our lab. Um, questions, concerns, paranoia. No, that's cool. I like the wall mount. Sorry. Go ahead, Craig. I was going to say that's cool. I like the wall mount. That's what I we, did with my setup recently. Yeah, we found that that was better. And the reason is because when we, in our other smaller lab, everything was on the table. And the concern I had was, is if when we do have to go to doing a screen-based version, then especially with a larger screen on the wall, is that um, the students are gonna be, it's too much for them, especially if they're having to do screen-based because of motion sickness issues. So, um, and we chose the large screens on the wall so that way then anywhere in the room I can very easily see what the students are doing in a catechist. And I can help coach and guide as they are working on a scenario. Couple of questions and Sh Sherry Lombardi has her hand up. Sherry? 
Hi. Hi, Rick. Hi. Um, Mitch, I have a question for you. So one, I'm jealous. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> and how large is your room and how many um, setups do you have? How many screens do you have in that room? So it was a standard size classroom. It wasn't anything super large. Um, I honestly don't know the true measurement. Okay. Um, but it's the stand. It was a classroom that we fit thirty-two students in. So I mean, it's about a standard classroom size for what we do. And I have eight student stations and one instructor station. And the instructor station is where I run the scenarios from. And as you can, I'll kind of show you that section over here at the instructor station. I don't have like a big podium. I don't have, um, I'm just going to do a quick unplug of some stuff here so I can move around a little more. I put you guys on one of our tables so that way then it hopefully isn't too shaky for you because I was afraid moving around would make people get motion sickness. So here's the instructor station that um, I use. And so like I said, there's no big podium. There's nothing else really in the way because I don't really just stand there. Um, I'm moving around the whole time I'm working with students. And so, you know, the important thing for it was is that it was a big enough screen that even students on the back side of the room would be able to see uh, what was going on um, if I was doing a demo of something. And so, and then as we come around the room, I'll kind of show you, mm -hmm. we have three stations then on this wall. And then we have two on the back wall, and then we have another three on the other wall. So eight total, Mitch. Eight total with a with a ninth for uh, for me. To work out. So we have a total of nine stations in this room. Okay, Mitch. While you're moving around, Candy has mm -hmm. asked, "Can you show a close up of the wall mounts?" Sure. I'm gonna come over here, and so on the on this one. So we have the, the CPU mounted to the wall. Um, we went with this style just because it was affordable. Um, the entire lab setup was about $80,000 is what it cost us to convert this entire room over. So, and that's including the screens, the computers, the uh, headsets, everything. Um, I think that technically right now we're like at 83,000 for the setup of this lab. So that's cheaper than the cost of a single mannequin. So um, that was kind of a nice thing with that. And then beneath it, we just have, it's a hanging um, setup where the headset um, goes onto this. It is a very heavy duty mount. I wanted something steady. So that way, um, it's not gonna get accidentally broke. So we went with a nice metal one. So that way it was really solid for um, our purposes. And then we have the wires coming down for charging, but then when we are ready to run simulation, I can unplug and run it wireless. Or if um, I'm doing like on Tuesday, I did a um, eight hour day of VR simulation. So I ran it wired the whole time so that um, our headsets didn't lose power. Very good. And Carlene is asking about getting some pictures of the setup. Um, Carlene, if you can drop us your email address, we'll make sure that Mitch gets that. Yes, and I actually have some that I um, am gonna send to John. And actually I have some even with, when we were working with students, um, and we'll be happy to share those out um, to you guys. Absolutely. Yeah, Mitch, there was a, isn't there a, a video perhaps out on the web or on your college site showing the lab? Am I mistaken? We just took the photos from the marketing department um, a couple, uh, about two weeks ago. So there's actually going to be a 3D tour available of the lab. Okay, fantastic. And we got your email. Thank you, Carly. Got it. And uh, our website is nwtc.edu. And if you go through the virtual tours, um, I'm not sure when that's going to be up, but I know they brought in the big 360 camera 
and they actually set it up as a virtual tour that you can do in virtual reality. Mm. Okay, we have Jeffrey with his hand up. Jeffrey? Yes, thank you for this presentation. Um, let's see, when you're running a session, right, and you have a bunch of students that are in the virtual space, um, are you both the moderator, um, the engineer, and the teacher? Or do you have the, the clinical instructor join from one of the other stations while you manage the, you know, the tech, the virtual mannequin in the background? Um, we do a combo of different things. Okay. Um, like with what we did the other day, I was the instructor and the person running the scenario. Um, next week, I am just going to be the person running the scenario as running the mannequin. Um, so right now, you know, with this all being new, we're still kind of figuring out our workflows and how we make that work best for us. Um, right now, I will say that um, our faculty are super excited and they want to be in here all the time. I went and did the math yesterday. We will be running a total of 43 scenarios this semester alone in a catechist. So, um, and with that being our first times of doing things like, I don't know nothing about birth and no baby. So when we're doing the birthing scenario next week, my, the instructors are coming in and I've been working with them. I'm like, okay, here's how we're going to flow this. Here's what we're going to do. Let's, we're going to try this out. And then when we do it again in December, I'm going to, we're going to try a new approach and see what works. And then every student is required. I don't let them leave my room until they complete a survey to get their feedback on how they feel it went. Because, you know, I may perceive that we had a great day and their experience might've been, yeah, this was dumb. So, but I'll say overall so far, students have loved it. The data has been fantastic. And um, just on Tuesday, I had a student said, can we not ever go to the sim lab again and just always come here? <laughs> because they liked it so much more than regular sim because they didn't feel like someone was staring at them and judging the whole time, even though I was, but they couldn't feel it because they couldn't see me doing mm -hmm. this and so they really appreciate the fact. And then I'm going to ask the faculty because so on Tuesday, they did VR with me. And then on Wednesday, they went up to our STEM lab. So I want to talk to the faculty now and say like, okay, how did that STEM go? Because we did a simulation on electrolyte imbalance. And then they had another simulation that was different on electrolyte imbalance. So I wanted to see if that was helping them to do better and to feel more confident and more and have greater self-efficacy in the sim lab when they had to incorporate the psychomotor portion mm -hmm. of simulation into this. And so I'm really hoping to get some good feedback from our faculty about their perceptions of it. And then I'm re-emailing the students uh, another survey to say like, okay, after doing VR, how do you feel that you did in the sim lab and did it help you? Did it give you, you know, an advantage that you feel? Uh, so I'm really hoping that that will give something for them. Well, yeah. I, I, I have Please another question, yes. if I may. Sure. Um, when you're in engineer mode, do you prefer to be uh, in a catechist with a headset or with uh, in desktop mode? Desktop mode, definitely. Um, okay. And I'll say why for this reason. In the headset, I feel like I have a limited view of what my students are doing because I can only see who I'm looking at. Whereas with when I'm in desktop mode and I have all these screens around the room, I can at a quick glance see exactly where each person is and what they're doing. And I find that that helps me to be able to respond faster and to uh, catch issues easier because um and then what i also do is i will pull up and i can see on my screen as well because when i'm on desktop mode and i kind of position myself in the corner so that i can look at my screen real quick kind of see what i see there and then i can do a quick just circle around the room and see what every all my students are doing and i usually only put two or three students in a scenario at a time so just like you do in regular sim i'll have two or three that are doing the assessment portion and then two or three that will work on passing meds 
and then two or three that are going to do um, some interventions with things. So I kind of do the similar methods that I've always done in SIM. I'm just applying them here, and instead of having a physical mannequin, I just have a digital mannequin. Right. Thank you. Anything else, Jeffrey? I'm not yet. Okay, great. Well, the questions are rolling in. Um, Mitch, we have Annie next. Annie. Hi, Mitch. Hi. Nice to see you again. <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, I just had two questions. I yeah. believe you guys were using the HP Reverbs previously, were you not? So we started off with HP Reverb, well, actually, reverse. We started off with the Oculus Rift S. And then we ran into a Facebook issue because you had to have a Facebook login. So then we switched to HP Reverb G2s because that got rid of that issue. So I traded out with our IT department. They took my Rift because they were going to use them for teaching students. And I took the HP Reverb uh, to do that. Then when this lab was opened, we got the uh, Quest 2s. And we've always in this lab used Quest 2. Um, and the reason for that was because of the wireless functionality. And we really wanted to go for that wireless um, since we didn't really know of anybody else doing that. And we were trying to be innovative. And um, I'll say that if you ever want to go wireless, talk to us. And we'll help you out because we've learned a lot of lessons about running a wireless headset through that. Uh, nothing bad, just some things that we had to kind of work through some growing pains of figuring out how settings should work and everything. And now we're exploring the G2s, or not sorry, the G2s, the Quest 3s, because of their augmented reality capabilities, um, because I've really kind of been into playing with augmented reality as well um, for some other things that I want to do with students. So we're looking at, and I actually have a Quest 3 right now here in the room. Um, that we are going to start using, testing out, seeing how we like, if we get better connection, better battery life, things like that. Um, so we are, we may be upgrading from Quest 2s to 3s within the next uh, couple months if we find that they give us a better overall user experience. Okay, so no specific reason why you switched from the reverbs other than the Quest gives you the wireless option? Correct, I and mean, we really oh. wanted that option. The, uh, the reverbs work great. Um, we don't have any issues with them. Um, in fact, I on the laptops, when I go into a classroom to do a virtual reality scenario as a um, test prep, because I will take in the laptop and the headset, and I'll set it up in the classroom and have it broadcast on the screen in the room, and then we run through a scenario uh, before students take exams. So that way then they can, we can talk about different concepts um, through a virtual reality scenario. Perfect. In fact, we're working on a pharmacology one that is in production right now with a catechist still that is meant for uh, students to be able to do as a um, test exam prep for pharmacology courses. Oh, nice. Um, one last question. So your stations are fairly close to each other. If a student is in the same simulation, do you have any like overlapping audio or feedback type situations happening? Yep, and I, um, so when they do the tutorial, I always make sure and tell them on the Academicus menu portion of it to focus on how to turn off your mic. And so that way then when they start their scenario, I'm like, okay, everybody turn off your mic. And that way then we don't have that issue with the echo in headsets. Um, so yeah, if we were doing remote, that would be a, and I'm hoping at some point I'm going to be able to run these from home or down in my office because my okay. office is in the basement. I'm on the third floor right now. So, you know, I'm hoping at some point that we're going to have that ability for students. So, um, yeah, we absolutely, um, would do that in the future, but for right now, that's where we're at. Perfect. Thank you, Mitch. No problem. Hey, thanks for the question. Okay. We're going to be going, uh, David, Nina. Sharon and Angela. So I've got everybody going here. So question, uh, Mitch, from David. Uh, how do you clean the devices between uh, users? I know there are some disposable VR brow pads, but you're using the clean box, right, Mitch? We use the clean box, which gives us 99.9% .9 cleanliness. I just push the button twice. So all you do is you open up 
the you mount the you take the headset and you just literally put it in here and it hangs up. You throw in the controllers, close the doors, ultraviolet light comes on and cleans your devices for you. And like I said, I just re-hit the button again, give them twice to make sure that they get really good and clean. Um, and then we also um, will use these in between as well. So we have electronic wipes that are safe to use on everything. And so we, um, at the end of the day, I go through and I give everything a wipe down with these. So each station, I grab three of these little um, wipes and I go through and I literally wipe down every single thing from the keyboard, the mouse, the headset, the controllers, uh, even the table, I make sure. And then I like to go through afterwards because I am a nurse and I am a germaphobe. So then I go through and I will, um, spray things down with microban because <laughs> again, germaphobe. <laughs> Thanks, Mitch. Um, and now Nina, she wants to know what are some simulations you're using? What are some of the things you're doing in a catechist? Um, we use the uh, safety, ha uh, safety identification or the hazard identification uh, scenario for our first semester students. We have been, I wrote a new one that we've been doing for our electrolyte issues. Um, I have created one for prioritization within the uh, four bay space. So students have to pre coming into here, they get given the list of patients and their information. And then they have to come in and they're going to decide uh, who am I gonna see first, second, third and fourth. And then they're gonna do the scenario. And then afterwards, they're gonna reflect on were they correct in their choices of who to see first, second, third, and fourth. Um, we are doing the birthing scenario. We are doing, um, I'm trying to think now, because <laughs> we've done so many. Um, several of them I've just made and a lot, some of them I just kind of made myself a generic med surge room. And so then I will have students come in and just do things like when they're worried about an exam, I'll have them come in and I throw them in our med surgery room and we just talk about like, okay, so if we were getting this result with this, what would you look at? What would you do here? And really, here's the fun thing. I'm not building crazy scenarios for that, but because I'm putting them in a headset and I'm kind of isolating them from distractions of the world, they can focus and remember what I'm talking about with them. So when I'm providing kind of that coaching about you know, okay, let's talk about this lab. And even though I'm not putting labs in there, they're not seeing a lab result, but I'm talking about it with them in a space that makes it special. And so they remember the moment. And so when they're taking their exams, they're able to remember what we're doing. So um, I find that, you know, sometimes just getting them in the headset and kind of getting them out of their head and out of, oh, I need to go to the grocery store later and I need to make sure I pick up peanut butter, or I need to make sure and get the dog's medicine, or I need to do this or that, or all those other things that go in their brain. When you put them in a headset, that goes away. And they're able to focus on really what you're wanting to do in that moment with them. And that's where the gold is. Hey, thanks, Mitch. All right, uh, Sharon, we'll take your question now. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Mitch. Great ideas. This is so inspiring. You had mentioned using eight students and giving them different roles. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask, is that within one scenario? Um, they get a report, they get the pre-brief, all eight students, and then you switch out their roles. And do you just say, okay, students, now I need, you know, Jane and Bob to give the medications. So we do pre-brief and in the pre-brief, I'm like, okay, you, you, and you, you're gonna be our assessment nurses and you and you, you're gonna be the med nurses and you and you and you, you're gonna be doing this. And then I give them, um, I always call it their caucus time. I give them about like 15, 20 minutes to chat and discuss who's gonna do what, what's their approach gonna be? Because part of debrief is 
I ask is, um, you know, what was your approach to providing care for that? And what would you do differently next time after learning what you've learned? And so I try to use it more, again, just like I would do in regular simulation. It's the same scenario. We break up in pieces. I have them do SBAR reporting off to each other. Even though they've heard each other, I want them practicing that SBAR. And I also then have the, my, one of my requirements is, is that students, when they're getting an SBAR, are required to provide critique back to the people who gave reports right in that moment. Like, okay, what did you think of that report? And then we go into the scenario again. And I find that that has worked very well for me so far and that the students respond well to it. So, um, but I like them giving the report to each other in the, um, I've been doing now where they actually give report to each other in the headset. So I'll turn um, people off a of ghost mode and then they meet in the hallway and they have a discussion and they do their report there. And that has worked really well for me, so. So all of the students are in headsets um, and do you ghost to the ones that are not actively participating in the scenario? Or do they just kind of hang out until they're called to? So to... I put, um, I'll put the first group in the headsets and then um, as the first group is finishing up, I kind of tell the other, cause I have everyone in, but I have them then take off their headset okay. and I just ghost them. So that way they're still in the hallway. They're not in the room. They're not causing more delays in the stuff. And we also made sure like when we designed the lab, we gave a, we put our own access point for Wi-Fi. So we have a ton of bandwidth. So then it doesn't cause a big issue. Um, so that was a big thing for us was when working with the network team, you know, making sure that we were gonna have the bandwidth to really, um, cause with wireless headsets, and we wired all of our CPUs. So while they're attached to the wall, they are actually plugged into the ethernet. So they're not pulling any of that bandwidth. The only thing that pulls bandwidth is our headset. Yeah, because that is a real issue um, and has been for us, I think, looking, looking back. Um, <laughs> so if we've already purchased the we've already purchased a bunch of laptops. <laughs> you, you talked about the CPUs. Mm -hmm. You can still work with a laptop. It's again, because if I would have bought, if laptops would have been cheaper than desktops, I would have bought laptops. I just didn't want them to be the only solution to be mobile. I wanted a solution that where we could have where faculty aren't having to be like, okay, let me go get the cart with the computers. Okay, I'm gonna go take it to my right. room. I've got to completely change around my room and move tables and move chairs right. and set up a room and then take out the computers and then set everything up and then tear it all down and put everything back. No, but you, um, in our other lab in, so if I say ET-103, that's our other lab. So if I accidentally spout off the ET-103, just know that's not my room. That's the other room. Um, if we're over, like, because if I'm over there, I still do simulation over there sometimes. And so, because, um, like, I had a day that we had um, not only students coming, but I had visitors that were important visitors that we needed to kind of show off to, to kind of help get funding and things like that. And so, um, I still use that space that has laptops on, te on tables that they use. Well, and we could still mount laptops, yeah. mm -hmm. right? You could still, to get them off of the desk, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. I mean, say, and like I said, there's tons of solutions. This was our way. It is not the way. It is a way. <laughs> and um, if there's ever a question, if you guys are like, hey, I don't really know what to do hit me up and I'm happy to like video chat with you and look at the space you have and discuss like, have you thought about this way or is this a solution that you might look at or here's another way of looking at it. So, um, you know, cause I've, I've literally worked through a ton of permutations of how to do different ways yeah. and I've thought about it a ton. So I'm happy to share any insights I might have from things that we've tried that didn't work well. Well, we're going through a lab renovation now at NMSU, so thinking ahead just to those Ethernet options, right? Connect mm -hmm. that way instead of using the Wi-Fi and limiting bandwidth. Yeah, thank yep. you. And another thing, oh, that I'll say that we did that 
Um, I made sure and had a dimmer put in my room on the light on the light because with the um, when students come out of the headsets, if you have really bright lights in your room, that's going to hurt their eyes. So make sure that if you're looking at a lab, if you can put a dimmer on there, because then when we run VR, I turn those lights down. So that way, when students come out of the headset, they're not getting the, when your spouse turns on the light in your bedroom and you do the uh, move, like, because they do get that a bit because, so just something to think about there. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Mitch. Angelina, I think you had had your hand up. It's down now. Did oh, you? I was just going to, um, I was just thinking about sending that in the chat, uh, but um, thank you. I would just ask here. Um, I was just having a question regarding uh, when we're switching headset from student to student, um, we are having trouble keeping the headset active when it's on and off the students. And also the guardian boundary often messed up. Uh, switching from one to the other, we tried turning the guardian boundary off, but then that messed up the height sometimes. So is there any way how you tackle this issue? That's why we have eight stations because a clinical group is eight students. And so um, as long, and there's now an update in a catechist that you can turn off the reset that was causing that issue because we were having this same exact problem. And so um, in, uh, I will say another great thing about a catechist, we ask a question, we got an answer the same day, and we knew where we were going and headed. But when you go into those settings, you turn off that reset, then you don't lose your height setting, because it doesn't kick you back out of it. And you don't lose your connection to the scenario that you're in. And Angelina, can I just clarify, or what headsets are you using? Um, we use Quest 2. We also, we're using Rift S, particularly for a catechist, but we're thinking about switching to other headsets. Um, we had the Quest 2 inactive issue a lot. Like when you uh, take it off the students and you put on again, you have to, um, uh, you find out you're quitting outside the app already because that being inactive. Yeah, that reset is now an option within a catechist, and that's what was causing that. Because when you take off the headset, you would see the countdown on the screen saying resetting in 10, 9, 8, and it would count down. That you can turn off now, and so that took care of that problem for us. Um, I, just, I just had a response. This is Sean with the catechist. And uh, in regards to the quest, um, when it turns itself off, that's its um, internal sleep mode. And that, that can be set, although um, if you do increase it to four hours, that would, uh, that would drain a lot of its battery. However, it would prevent it from disconnecting from um, Wi-Fi and, and the link connection, because that's what can happen also if it's um, idle for too long, it will go to sleep and then it loses its link connection to the PC. And once it does that, the PC says that it can't find the the head mounted display and then our app expects it to find that. So then there becomes an issue there. So one of the workarounds we've been suggesting for people that use Quest through Link is um, either the cable or Wi-Fi is to make the sleep mode within the Quest um, increased. I mean, the maximum is four hours, but they have other options. I just have to be mindful of the, the battery life. Yeah, and we changed ours to because we're never going to have students doing a scenario for longer than an hour. So we just set it for an hour and that kind of guarantees that we're not going to go over that time period ever. And, and like I said, once we've made those changes and yeah, thanks to the help from Akatakis and uh, Sean and uh, John and Stefan and Rick, we have, uh, we've, we've got that down to a pretty smooth process. And so Working with them, they will give you some good guidance to make that process a lot smoother. And like I said, since we kind of reached out to them and worked through it, we've gotten much better results with it. Thank you. Um, and also, um, w since you have eight students there, um, do you have each student have their own account? So what do you mean account? 
a Catechist account or you oh. put all of them in guest mode? Yeah, we just put them all in guest mode and um, I make sure that they put their preferred name in. If they have a preferred pronoun, I have them put that in as well so that um, as they're working with their peers and everything and and myself, because I don't really know, always know the students because I don't teach their classes. I'm just here for them to come in and do the VR stuff. So I make sure, so I like their name and pre preferred name and preferred pronouns in their name in a catechism. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, thanks, Angelina. Anything else? Okay, comment from Craig. Um, just asking Mitch, have you ever considered the uh, systems, the wiring systems where you, they uh, get attached to the ceiling so they dangle down from the top. Did you look at those? Yep, we are um, in the process of trying to figure out what, because where we are, we have to make sure that we don't have anything within 18 inches of the sprinkler head. So because those are close to certain stations, so we're trying to figure out how to have those go up to the ceiling and come across without being too close to the sprinkler heads. So um, we're working with our facilities team to try to figure out how we're gonna do that without uh, breaking any laws. Mm -hmm. So yeah, because we did that in our other lab and it was really nice. Um, it's kind of a pulley system um, for those who've ever worked in a hospital or even offices or whatever where you have the badge pulley. Um, they use those in our other lab to test out as a theory. Um, but we're now looking at how do we do that here to prevent the trip issue, but mostly we run wireless. So then it's not a problem, but on the longer days, um, I just make sure that I keep a closer eye and that no one is getting themselves tied up in their court. Okay. Um, we have one from Vienna Baker. Uh, Vienna Baker here from Cochise College. I'm sorry to, oh, she's just saying she had to duck out early. Thank you, Mitch, for the virtual tour. And we'll go, Bill's mentioned that they also hardwire their computer to the network or the cable when they're using laptop, uh, even at, when he's at his regionals. Um, Jeffrey has a question to the Academicus folks. Is it possible to set up a local router to handle the headset traffic without burdening our larger network? Interesting question. And I don't want to jump in on that, Sean, unless you have a comment. Yeah, let me just reread that question. Is it possible to set up a local router to handle the headset traffic without burdening our larger network? I will say, Jeffrey, that I know that you can allocate a specific wireless router and point just the headsets to it. So it would just, and that traffic's only going from the headset to the computer, right? And so networking geniuses are able to route that traffic very specifically if you can uh, get them to understand what you're trying to do. Um, I, would, I would agree with that. But the headset and the laptop have to be connected to the larger LAN in order to run a catechus, right? You know, to just be the laptop or or computer actually, not necessarily the headset. Aha. Uh -huh. Right. The, uh -huh. the, yeah, I think they're talking about just the connection, um, the the air link essentially yes. from the quest to the to the PC. To right. Get, uh, yep. To get the higher because uh, you do need quite a bit bandwidth there to get um, a smooth uh, mm -hmm. experience. Right, and um, our 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 LAN really isn't set up for that. Um, I mean, we have to do some testing to mm -hmm. see how well it would work. Okay, thanks. Um, and I'll just say that there is a dongle attachment that you can get for the Quest that you can use to help direct and have a better link and it can decrease some of that bandwidth pool because we've actually been looking at playing with that too because my dean is already talking about building another lab because of the use that we're already getting and that he sees that we're, this is going to become a big thing in the future and 
So we've actually already been looking at how do we help minimize some of that pool on the bandwidth. And um, we've been talking and discussing the Quest dongle that plugs into the PC and um, helps that connection be stronger for the AirLink. Right. And another issue is that the hospital's um, guest network, which is what we're using for VR, forbids every kind of casting that they the network people could think of. And there's a very good chance it'll block this too. That's a great question. And I'm sorry, I don't have an answer. <laughs> well, I'll, I mean, we're going to test it like, tomorrow or <laughs> we'll let you know <laughs> and jeffrey and everyone else i dropped the uh link for that wireless dongle from meta uh in the chat if you want to take a look at it that, that's I'm, I'm glad you brought that up mitch that's actually a great idea that connects the headset directly to the dongle that's connected to the pc or laptop mm -hmm. so oh, for strengthening cool. that connection it's a really great option yep Okay, let's go to uh, Sharon. You had another question. Um, I did for Mitch. Just the practicality of administering medications in the virtual world. Um, our students have struggled a little bit with um, grabbing the medication, doing the calculations in their head, getting the cup <laughs> with the water, bringing it to the a mannequin do you go into that detail or do you just have them verbalize okay i'm administering so many milligrams or do, do you have them go through those psychomotor um exercises in vr for that i do a combo of what you're talking about so i tell them that when they are preparing the meds at the little cart um as they're doing things i'm like okay so instead of grabbing everything and going over, we're just gonna say that you put it in your little fanny pack and I let them then just teleport next to the bed. And then, um, and, I mean, they don't really have a fanny pack, but I'm like, so you put it in there so it's safe while you travel. <laughs> and then when they go there, it, I say, you know, I want you to do the education. I want you to talk through it, you know, cause I said, you know, my statement is always, I could train a monkey to pass a med. That doesn't mean they understand the med and the safe part. What makes you a nurse is that you understand those things. So what you need to do is focus on how do you pass that med safely? Have, and, I, and we work through how do you do the five right? How do those three checks work? And we work through that more as a, I don't wanna say just a thought experiment, but we kind of work through it and we talk about it. and. I still have them kind of act out the steps without worrying about teleporting with a pill and the cups and everything else, because they'll do that in the sim lab. Right. Here, I want to focus on the thinking. And that's really, and that's the thing that I think that people kind of get hung up on is that they don't realize that, you know, when VR, you got to, while it's still simulation and you still have a mannequin, the approach and the goal is different because the goal is critical thinking, not skill acquisition. And so when you can, and it took me a while to get my head around that. And it was kind of by John smacking me around a few times <laughs> and being like, the point of a catechist is not skill acquisition. The point of a catechist is critical thinking. And so, because I kept being like, but John, why can't we do this? And why can't you make it do this? And he'd be like, because that's not what we're doing. And then it finally sunk in and I'm like, okay, I got it. I'm on the page with you now. And it started to click more. And um, I quit fighting him on it. Because <laughs> I, I pushed back a few times. I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure we're not going to do skill acquisition? Are you sure we're not going to have these checkoff things? And um and once I kind of got my head in the right spot on it and I fell into that, that thinking place, I'm like, okay, now I'm getting it. And it's hard to get students to go there in the beginning. So I find in the pre-brief, that's the important time when you say, this is not about your skill. This is about your thinking. And I, like I say, imagine you're taking a test. And that you're playing out a scenario in your mind of what you would do 
when you're thinking about a test question. And that kind of helps them to get into that mode then instead of being in a checkoff or a simulation in the sim lab, it gets them into the right mindset. And that's really what I've been focused on is how do I get my students to get in the right mindset to think about a catechist is not skill acquisition. Super helpful, thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for the question, Sharon. Okay, what else do we got? I don't think we have any. We have a new question from Angelina. Oh, Angelina, uh, yes, I had to scroll back up. Angelina, go ahead. Would you like to uh, elaborate on your question? Um, yeah, so um, I had this question from our clinician that um, there, so when you have a patient that are deteriorating, um, you have to let your students know that this is happening. And also I feel like transitioning between one stage to the other are just really difficult because you're switching like five switches in a catechist uh, as an engineer for the students. Um, how do you plan that transition so that it's smooth for you and, uh, and your students can also feel like, oh, the patient is deteriorating? I duplicate my scenario. So I go in, I resave it. So like I'll say, let's say, um, you know, med surge one, and then I'll save another version as med surge two, and then I save another version as med surge three. And then I add holocron into the room. And so when I'm ready to transition, click the holocron and it reloads into the next one. So like, if you think about the anatomy lab where that's at, uh, in the commons and you have those different things where you can load the different pieces of anatomy, you can add those holocrons into your space. And usually I put them in the bathroom um, because then they're out of the way and students don't see them. And so then I can, like when we're, while we're kind of doing that transition of headsets or whatever, I just go over and boop into that holocron for the next stage. And then it goes black and it reloads. And then we have our next scenario. Yeah, that's that's a, very interesting. Uh, I never thought of it. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, I have an, another sort of workaround like that that people have um, used. Um, and that's to use the 3D recording feature. Mm -hmm. As long as there's not as many uh, things that, that you're changing, if there are only a few and pretty easily accessible, you could record yourself making those changes and um, then just play that back at the appropriate time. I think the benefit there, well, I guess there's pros and cons with that, but I guess the benefit of that is you don't have to reload a scene and get everybody back to where they, I guess, were positionally or wait for the, the scene load. But the, the, I guess the downside of it is just, well, you have to find that recording and you could create a hologram for that recording too, but then you'd have to hide it and have to manage the recordings themselves. But um, just an alternate way to achieve the same thing, but we are also working on um, ways to make that kind of easier, something like a macro or just to essentially replay or, or do a certain set of actions as a preset for several different um, assets that we have. So we uh, definitely have identified that. Yeah, to add on to- too. Go ahead, Stefan. Oh, oh yeah, I was, that's what I was gonna I was about mention. To say. <laughs> um, so some of you may have seen those sequencer panels that we have in there that we've been adding to more and more scenarios. And those are basically just like um, an array of presets that you can click forward or back through. Um, but we have talked internally about making a generic sequencer that you could kind of build your own sequence. So that's, mm, I'd say more medium term horizon. So it's not, it's not like way far in the future, but it's not next week either, but we're definitely thinking about it. It's like, We've determined that it's possible. It's just uh, once we get through this batch of work, that's when we'll be able to get around to to building that out. So yeah, we're definitely thinking about better way or new ways to kind of achieve that seamless transition between stages. Thank you. This is great. Um, and are we in, regarding the three D recording? Are you able to have like multiple three D recording? Uh, for the scenario that ha you have multiple stages. I haven't yes. done that, so I don't know. So I'll let Sean and Stefan answer mm -hmm. to that one. Uh, yes, you can. You can make um, as many recordings as you can for however long um, they are 
you have to remember the context of them though because um if you do record yourself interacting with an asset the asset has to exist I, just in case you when you play it back kind of otherwise it'll be interacting with us, nothing so. but um no 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 but you can have multiple of them and one thing you could do is hide them in the scene the visibility of them um and make them uh i guess only visible to in, in edit mode uh, it's not recommended to go in edit mode while you're trying to teach because you can accidentally move things but um there, that is a way to kind of arrange them in the scene so that you are the only one that can see them. Um, but there is also a menu for the scene, uh, the 3D recordings. So you can have the menu up as an alternate um, and you can pull that menu out. So you can pull the recording menu out and have that just to the side and then um, just select the appropriate recording uh, and play them. But yes, to answer your question, you can have as many as you wish. Thank you. I haven't been utilized the 3D recording much, but this sounds really brilliant. I haven't used 3D recording much either just because I there's so many other cool things to do that I just haven't made it there yet. So um, like it, it seems like a really useful thing and I just haven't leveraged it yet, but I'm hoping that in the future that'll be something as we continue to grow our use of a catechist and um, as we continue to in this journey, that that will be something we'll be using more of. I always pitch immersive debriefing, and I don't think anybody's taken me up on that. But record a scenario and do your debriefing in the room with everybody around you. I just feel like why not? It's so cool. I mean, it's it's a next level uh, mm -hmm. implementation there. But I hope Kim Kim Ernstmeyer uh, couldn't make it today. But I hope she doesn't mind if I share that we're um, part of the Open RN project um, that we're finishing out is going to be to create a 3D recording of the birthing sequence. So it'll be an observable scenario. You'll be able to observe the entire birthing sequence all the way through. So we're hoping to have that in uh, hopefully sometime in the mid January and hopefully other scenarios as well, just so you'll be able to kind of watch an ideal play through of each of those scenarios. I just want to also mention when you do a recording and if you don't want to be seen as uh, in the scene, or uh, your avatar being a recorded avatar in the scene, you can enter ghost mode while you're doing a recording or uh, recording yourself. That way you don't see the avatar when it's played back if you, if you wish to be hidden. That was how I made our code blue recording, was put put it put in three D and you know turn off go into ghost mode. Um, we use three D recordings quite a bit, and um, our instructors will uh, usually send them to me to turn them in two D recordings as well. So there's a big benefit um, to utilizing that, and I think that's one of the underused. Uh, parts of um, of a catechist, and it's been a big discussion um, between myself and some of my faculty as to creating more 3D recordings, util utilizing those more, you know, even in pre-briefing, those kind of things um, can be very valuable. Good point. Thank you, Bill. Okay, other questions? We're at the top of the hour. Hopefully everybody's able to continue to hang on. I have no other hands up and no other questions in the chat. Uh, sorry, I just have one quick question. Oh, no, Angela, go ahead. Um, can you play two recordings simultaneously? Yes. Yep. You actually can have a recording record other recordings. Um, so you can do a very layered interesting things with it. That's I don't remember how many layers deep we go, but yeah, you can definitely <laughs> play multiple recordings back at the same time. You can have a recording record another recording. Um, yeah, it gets kind of, we kind of left it open so it can get kind of crazy, like once you really start digging in, but we've left it like that because then there's much more flexibility, so. Um, Just be careful not to open up a wormhole or anything like that, you'd be in another dimension. <laughs> It is possible. Going, you, you spend know. too much time with that 3D recording tool, you'll have really weird dreams that night. <laughs> is that what it is? Is that what's causing that, John? Now I understand. <laughs> um, recording within a recording. And a quick question for Mitch. Um, which Vidos monitor are you using? Um, for the monitor that we're using right now, we um, 
we have this issue that the um you can't hear the difference um like you you need to have a pitch difference um to indicate that the o2s are dropping um and the heart rates are getting faster i was just having that issue so i wonder which monitors you find helpful you mean the like the vital sign monitor in the room um I typically always use the same one and it doesn't have, um, I'm, I don't know. I'm gonna, I would have to go in there and look cause I kind of have my room saved and then I just edit rooms with what I need. So I don't have to go back through and try to find equipment again. So like in my med surge room, I have one monitor that's the one that I always like and then I can just swap out the patient in the room I can, because it's easier to find the patient than it is to find the monitors and everything else. So like I have my ICU room set up and I have my med surge room set up and I have my long-term care room set up and then I just tweak whatever I need and then resave it as that scenario. Um, I would have to go and look, but I can find out and then I can um, let John and them uh, email you uh, that answer because I would, ha I would have to go in there and figure out which one I select. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Angelina, I think, as far as I know, I think uh, your group there is the only one that's using that new, the vitals monitor with the sounds um, is like the newest, newest version. And so I think you may be the only people using that one so far. So if you do have an issue with it, please um, feel free to message me here in the chat or send an email because I would yeah, very much like to hear what's going on with that one. Thank you. I didn't know there was one with sound. And so I'm like, do we have one? Do I have one with sound? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an upgraded version. So it'll be able to replace the ones uh, that are in there currently for all the Gen 2 patients. But um, yeah, we're, we haven't quite rolled it all the way out yet. Well, Angelina, you let the cat out of the bag. Everybody wants the monitor now. <laughs> When's it coming, Stefan? No pressure. Okay. All right, Mitch, let's turn it back to you. Any other closing thoughts? Um, I guess what I'll say is, you know, don't get, don't let the technology overwhelm you and frighten you because overall it's, it's the same intuition that you use in regular simulation. It's the same type of concept. We're just approaching it in a different way. So my hope is, is that, you know, you will let this kind of help push you into, okay, what else can I do? What else can I think about? And don't get too hung up on what I'm doing or what everybody else is doing. Like, take, try things out, take risks. Students are going to love it no matter what. They think it's cool. They think it's fun. They are engaged in it. I literally have... Uh, there's times I have to turn students away because they're like, can we come do something else with you? Cause they want to be in here. They want to be using it. And, um, you know, if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you just want to ask, you know, how do we, you know, what do you think about this kind of setup for a lab or, you know, how do we get around some of this finance issues? Um, I've got real creative, um, you know, hospital foundations in your area, they're a great place to reach out to for funding and ask, you know, about, you know, hey, we're preparing your future nurses, we're preparing your future radiography techs and everything else, like cough up some cash so we can, uh, yes, I will actually put my email here in the chat. And if I don't respond, that means our firewall caught it. So then email John and say, please forward this to Mitch. <laughs> and Sharon has her hand up again. So yeah. I want to make sure. Sorry, all my questions. Um, I wondered if you have used um, family members or used like maybe standardized patients or other students to be the voice of a family member or other some kind of other um um, you know, discipline within the, the scenario. We, we certainly can't afford to have, you know, two faculty for every session, but when you want to incorporate a family member or another person, have you 
have you done that? We are making our first scenario for that. So what we're doing is we are doing a healthy newborn because we have a class called Complex Health Alterations 2. And in that they cover the um, ICU stuff and they get into NICU stuff. And so, um, so we have, we're making a, we've made a healthy newborn and we're gonna record that in 2D so that students will watch that as their pre. And then we're taking and using that same scenario with a few tweaks and turning it into a high risk newborn so that they can come in then and do that. And so there'll be a family member. So what I'm looking at doing is um, one of our sim lab techs from the sim lab upstairs is gonna come down and I'm gonna put her in a, with a laptop and let her be, um, and actually I may not have to have her be in the room or be in a in VR for it because she's not going to be controlling anything because she would just be going in as a guest and her voice would be there. So since we turn off mic, she can just answer and be that and have that script. So we are working with that for the first time because um, I'm trying to slowly phase into things because it's a little overwhelming at times. Uh, there's been a few times that I'm like, oh my God, I think I'm actually going to pee my pants during this time. So, um, but we we're getting there and like i said it's just that kind of i've been playing around my head like do we do a 3d recording of that person um do we do have an actual lab tech come in because right now i'm actually in the process of trying to make the case of we need to hire more people for this because i am but one person and there's only so much i can do with building creation running development um you know getting funding marketing like that is just becoming a lot and i'm like i i i need some help here so we're actually going to be looking at hiring someone to come in and be a tech for us um and that can help run scenarios even and you know, have the faculty come in and they're going to be sitting in the corner just like they would upstairs in the sim lab watching while the tech runs the scenario for them so we're actually going to be going more into that traditional sim lab model with that at some point we're just working on trying to get all that figured out with budgeting and everything else so great ideas thank you again absolutely kind of digress a little bit but um you mentioned uh, communicating with family members in the NICU I know that's something Dr. McAdams is very passionate about um, he and Dr. Trin have both been I think that's the next step for them is running simulations about, you know, breaking news to family members in the, in the NICU. I think that's a really important part of how they're, because they've got the, the resuscitation component of it, but now they're looking to expand into, you know, family, you know, soft skills, communications, things like that. And does anyone ever use like discord or because we could even make like a discord chat where that way then if questions come up, we could all even chat with each other and like, Hey, I ran into this and then anybody can pop in. So if that's something that would be open to, or because I think just yeah. taking the community and sharing more information um, and, you know, using that in a way that helps us to have that quicker conversation or like teams, because you can share teams throughout that you don't do in the same organization um so i mean there's different ways to look at that so yeah there's the catechist discord I, for, I forgot there is the one on there i have i use it mostly for gaming um because <laughs> i have some groups that i play video games with and we use the discord for that i use that's what i mainly use discord for but yeah that would be a great way for like us to chat and um, share thoughts, ideas, even because you can even record video and share in there of like, hey, here's something we're doing right now if you guys want to try it. And Yeah, and uh, Sean dropped the link to the Academicus Discord there in the chat if you're interested in, in joining it or if you need more information about what is this Discord thing, um, just reach out. We'll, we'll help you out. A I think Slack requires you to have patient. to have a subscription. So that's yeah, where Slack is a little harder. Yeah, but Discord works great. But I, I think a subgroup for, you know, standardized patient networking would be amazing because I think that's something everybody's sort of, you know, up against is, you know, finding people to play the role. And I've always imagined having a network of, of those types of actor, patient actors would be a great resource. 
can run into uh, each other's scenarios to help out and play family members or patients. And, and even to test out a scenario, because like for me, I, our students are required to have volunteer hours to graduate. Um, if they don't have those hours, they don't get their diploma. So um, I offer those hours um, to come in and test scenarios for me. So they come in and they do their um, volunteer hours here. Um, so they're learning and they're getting volunteer hours. So that to me works really well. Um, so, you know, don't forget about, you can leverage students for things. They can come and play a family member because that's not a standardized patient role. They don't need specialized training to be a family member. Um, and so I would sometimes, you know, I've, I've thought about using that, like my senior students who are getting close to graduation, can we schedule them to come in and be a family member in the VR scenario? I've done that in our regular sim lab. So I would be, I've, I've entertained that as well as now that we're getting going and we're getting more comfortable in the space. So, I mean, there's lots of options out there. Um, I, I've even talked with, we have a university down the road that has a theater program and I reached out to them and their faculty and they've offered students that are in theater to come and um, work and do things as uh, patients to build their resume. Because as a theater student, you gotta have some type of resume of things you've done and that's something that they can put out there for themselves. So, I mean, there's lots of ideas. I mean, there's lots of ways out there and we're only really limited by how creative we can get. And sometimes when your brain is stuck, reach out and say, hey, I'm stuck with this for a solution for this. What, what thoughts do you maybe have? Um, and, you know, especially if we can do it as a big team, then we get lots of ideas and ways to find solutions. Um, Mitch, I'd like to add, we use live actors in our Sim Center and there's jobs to be had for actors mm -hmm. in that role and they do an amazing job mm -hmm. they they have this ability to take very little information and just create this totally believable personality mm -hmm. out of it yep so i mean there's lots of solutions of things and like i said you can if you don't have the funds to pay for it you know at theater students because they're trying to build a resume to help them get out in the world and so if you can offer them a letter of recommendation or even if there's a way that you can i mean there's ways you can do that for them and give them something in a way that doesn't cost money so i'm glad that you've done that and that it's worked well for you jeff because um that's always a a challenge is finding a way to do that so all right all right, we're getting close to the end of our time. Any other questions? Okay. Well, one of the things, you know, I we obviously want to be able to do with this forum and format is, as Mitch had said just a, a few minutes ago, you know, being able to kind of be sharing information, contacting each other, reaching out, um, understanding again what the challenges are and how people kind of overcome them and you know and, and leverage success with the platform it's important that we kind of develop an understanding and, and comfort level with reaching out and, and talking to each other your discord right now i would say is probably that platform that's readily available to everybody that if you want to jump on there we can certainly rapidly ramp up with uh dropping in uh, information and links about who you are and how to contact you and what you're doing um, or some of the challenges you're having and have discussions on that, that platform, but also via email if you need to reach out to, to John, myself, or anybody on the Academy's team. Uh, Sean had dropped in there the link for our uh, uh, fresh desk uh, ticket, ticketing system. So if you're having an issue with Academy's, we can drop it in there and somebody's usually on it that very day within hours, um, we're typically able to get back in touch with you. Um, so please understand that all these uh, uh, resources are available to you at your, at your disposal. Um, okay, John, anything you wanna wrap up with or Bill, any comments you might wanna share before we go? 
Well, I want to thank everyone for coming. Really appreciate it. It's great to see everybody and hear about all the wonderful things you're you're working on and building. And I guess I'd reiterate what Rick said. If there's anything we can do to support your projects and help test simulations, help implement simulations, if there's any anything at all that we can do, we're we're here to help. Yeah, I I completely agree. Um, sorry, I've been a little quiet today. I've got something going on and starting to lose my voice here. So. Um, but, uh, I, I agree if there's anything that I can do to help as well, same thing, feel free to contact us and, uh, uh, we'll, we'll do what we can to help make things easier for you. And thanks very much to Mitch for the great presentation. That yeah. was amazing. I think very inspiring and helpful for people to see what all goes into it and how you've set that up. Yeah. It's really a cool, cool lab. And I look forward to getting up to to Green Bay and checking it out myself. Yes, thanks very much, Mitch. And of course, in the comments, everybody's going, great job, thank you. Um, if, they, if you're ever in town in Green Bay, Wisconsin, shoot me a message and you can come and hang out. Um, I'll even take you for a beer and some cheese curds. <laughs> oh, wow, that's, that's a good deal there, okay. Now that has been recorded, Mitch. I just want to remind you, uh, there'll be no backing out of that one. All right, well, we hope to be able to continue to have these quarterly. So you'll probably hear from us again, end of the year for January. <clears throat> and um, uh, you're gonna be a victim of your own success because we will be looking for members of the community like, like Mitch and like Bill, who we can highlight during these sessions. So, because again, this for us is all about being able to share that information uh, throughout the community. So thanks very much. And I'm sure we'll be talking to you all uh, one time or another in the near future. Mitch, thank you again. Thanks everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Everyone. Take care.